We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. So today, I'm kicking off a brand new teaching series that we're calling Excel, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. And as we kick off this series, um, I'm going to do something today that I've never, ever done before, okay? And that is, as I start a new series today, I'm actually going to begin by telling you about the next series that I'm going to be teaching, okay? And I'll explain why in just a moment. In just a couple of weeks, I'm going to begin a marriage series that we're calling Before and after you say, I do. Before and after you say, I do. And so this series is not just a marriage series for married people. This is a marriage series for everyone. So maybe you're right now single. You one day want to be married. Then this is a marriage series for you. And if you're currently married, you one day want to be single. This is a marriage series definitely for you. Okay. And so you want to make sure that you've got this kind of on your radar, okay? And again, this is not exclusively, exclusively for married people, okay? And so I'm sharing it with you to kind of prep you for it, also to ask you to pray for me as I prepare for this series. And the reason that I shared this with you today, the third reason is, is because it, to what we're going today is really setting up where we're going to be headed in, in that marriage series. Uh, unfortunately, did you know that today that 50 of all marriages are um, currently either ending in divorce or in separation. And statistically, um, the second and third marriages that people go into, the the statistics are much worse. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. That's just statistically what it is that we're looking at in our culture, in our society. And do you know what the number one cause of stress on marriages is? Any, Any guesses? Okay, so I'm hearing a lot of answers. I've heard children, okay? True. Um, okay. Uh, finances. Um, one that you may not realize is actually a leading cause of stress on marriages is Facebook. Facebook. But that's not what this series is about, okay? Today we're kicking off a series that's kind of leading up to our our marriage series. And let me show you what I mean. Uh, According to a study by Truist, finances are the number one cause of stress in a marriage. Another study by the Institute for Divorce Financial Analysis makes money issues the third leading cause of all divorces. And so today, as we start off, or before we kick off a marriage series in a couple of weeks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some time um, and teach from the Word of God on what would it look like if we were to bring our financial worlds and to bring order and and the gospel to the center of our financial worlds. Okay, so I want you to just imagine with me the stress that we're all feeling financially. Really just imagine life. Like imagine you as a single person, you're you're finishing college, you're launching off into a career. Imagine yourself in a position where you're not feeling this weight of college debt behind you. Or maybe you've already started the career and you're feeling that weight of college debt. But imagine having a plan in place to actually like eliminate that debt. Or for those of you that are married, like just imagine yourself in a position where you're not feeling this pressure of living week to week with your finances. Or you're not continually feeling bogged down by debt. Like just imagine what it could look like, and not only for your marriage, but I, when I think of this, I think about even our young people and kids point and student life. Like, you know, they pick up on so much more than what we realize. So just imagine an environment in your home where you're not feeling this financial pressure and where the kids aren't feeling it either. Like, so just, I want to dream together throughout the course of this series as we talk about what does it look like to bring the gospel to the center of our financial worlds. And so to do that, what I'm going to do is I want to turn your attention to a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And while you're turning there, I just want to say a couple of things about this series, okay? Number one, it was really on my heart to teach this series outside of the context of any special offering, okay? And so it's not like I'm teaching this series and then at the end of it, we're going to make an ask for our, our year-end legacy offering. And for those who don't know what that is, that's our annual year-end offering that goes to accelerating our vision as a church, okay? And so understand that at the end of this teaching, there's no like offering that we're taking up or special 
special offering um, in, 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 you know, in this context, all right? A second thing that I wanna mention about this series is that as a church, we have never been in a better place financially. We've never operated um, from a place of more margin, okay? And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because of your incredible generosity and your trust in what God is doing. And then secondly, because of the incredible financial stewardship of our team. And and I'm telling you that this morning, here's why. It's because I know, like I've been in a church setting before. Some of you are thinking, oh my gosh, he's talking about finances. The church has to be in trouble, right? And it's not that at all. Okay, the whole goal of this series is to begin to ask the question and then to take practical steps in terms of bring, bringing the gospel to the center of our, our financial worlds, okay? And so I don't want you to feel any fear, any pressure, none of that, okay? This is simply we're opening God's word and we're asking God, what would it look like to begin to bring the gospel to the center, the freedom of the gospel to the center of our financial worlds? And so 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, this is where our title comes from. And we're going to read it out loud together, both campuses. Ready? But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Okay? So Paul says that since you excel in everything, the the word excel, it means to abound. And since you excel in everything, and then he goes on to give this list pertaining to the things of God. Okay? So we don't want to be average when it comes to the things of God. I mean, we don't want to be average in anything, right? Who wants to be mediocre at anything that we do? And we certainly don't want to be average or mediocre when it comes to the things of God. We want to excel in the things of God. And this is what's interesting is this list that Paul lists after he says, since you excel in everything, this list is actually a parallel to the list of spiritual gifts that Paul gave the church in his first letter to, to Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. Okay, so you're taking notes, write that passage down. 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, Paul lists these spiritual gifts that, that God had given the church, okay? Out of, out of his grace, he gave the, the church these gifts, and now he's given this list as a parallel to to that list, all right? And he says, you're excelling in these areas of your spiritual giftedness, okay? You're stewarding the grace of God well in these areas of, of your giftedness, all right? And so understand that this is very weighty, very, very weighty. In fact, I think of what what Peter says in 1 Peter 4.10, as each of you has received a gift, let him minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And so that means that your spiritual giftedness, how God has gifted you spiritually, look, as you exercise that gift, as you live out that gift, you are stewarding God's grace in your life. Okay, so what that means is, is we, we got to stop thinking like when we serve on the prayer team or when we serve as an usher or as a greeter or in the parking lot or in Kids Point or in student life. Like, look, we got to eliminate a mindset of volunteering. Okay, we got to eliminate that mindset and we've got to understand, know that when I am serving out of my giftedness, I am stewarding the grace of God in my life. That's heavy. That's weighty. Are you with me? Like God is at work through that stewardship. So what Paul is saying is just as you excel in your spiritual giftedness, you want to excel in the grace of giving as well. Gospel-centered generosity, or we could even kind of paint it as a bigger picture, gospel-centered finances. We want to excel in, in this area. Now, let me show you the original word in the Greek language for this word excel, okay? And, and all of you note takers, you want to write this down. In the, in the Greek, the word excel is the word perisuo, okay? Perisuo. Everybody say perisuo. Perisuo. And you want to write that down. And you want to write it down because I'm going to show you a cool connection that we're going to make in, ju- in just a moment, okay? So it's the Greek word perisuo. It means to abound, Okay, but I also want you to know that in the first century world, that what this word also meant is it carried with it this imagery of a flower going from a bud to a full bloom. 
Okay, so if you heard the word perisumo in the first century world, this is the imagery that you would have from a bud to a full bloom. So on the days when I pick up our daughters from school, um, we, we have a little exercise that we use to force them to talk to me, okay? <laughs> And, and it's a little tool that we learned from one of their teachers. And so everybody in the car, you have to give what is your thorn, what is your rose, and then what is your bud? Any other parents use this? It's a lot of fun, okay? It's a lot of fun. Okay, so what's your thorn, what's your rose, and what's your bud? Okay, and the thorn is what's the worst part of your day? Your bud, or your rose rather, is what's the best part of the day? But my personal favorite is to hear what their bud is. Because the bud is the thing that they have coming up that they look forward to the most. Like this is the area or this is the thing that you can, you just listen and you can think, okay, to hear them say what their bud is, it's the area that they see as having their greatest potential. The thing that they're most excited about. And so, What's incredible is when we think about this word, as Paul uses this word in the first century and the imagery of this word, what he's saying is, is like think about the potential, the potential for kingdom impact within what God has entrusted you to steward for his glory, okay? Do you see what we're doing? Like we're bringing the gospel, the life of Jesus to the center of our financial worlds. And this is huge. Because a lot of us just think of money as money. No, it's an opportunity to steward well what God has entrusted to you. And this is very weighty and is very, very powerful. So as we look at this passage, there's a couple things you need to know about it, okay? In 2 Corinthians 8, all right? What you need to know is, is that Paul, as he writes to the church, he's calling the Corinthian church to re-engage in an offering that had been taken up for the Jerusalem church, the mother church, because the, the Jerusalem church had gone through a very severe famine and they were in a very, very difficult season. So Paul had gotten, gotten all of the churches he had planted to engage in administering this offering that would be sent back to the church in Jerusalem. Now, this served a couple of purposes. One purpose is, is that it was to kind of bring down a barrier between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And so because of their generosity, it would bring down a racial barrier that existed between these two groups. So it's a powerful thought there, okay? But a second reason for this offering the second reason was for the sanctification of the Corinthian believers. Now, sanctification is a big word. And what sanctification just simply means is it be means becoming more and more like Jesus. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so this offering was to bring them through a process of sanctification, of becoming more and more like Jesus. Okay, this explains why a discussion around our finances can feel so sensitive. The reason the discussion around finances feels so sensitive is because it, it tells us how closely our hearts are connected to our finances. Have you ever thought about that? Like, why is it so sensitive? Because our hearts are so closely connected to our financial world, okay? Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 21, for where your what? Where your treasure is, there your what? Heart will be also. A lot of us have in our mind that our money follows our heart. But Jesus says, no, your heart actually follows your money. And so I just want to say, like, I recognize that me teaching on finances, like some of you, like it's, it's stirring up some things in you. Some of you are feeling guilt. Some of you are feeling shame. Some of you are like, thank, thank you for teaching on this. But my point being is that it's a very sensitive discussion because our hearts are so closely connected to it. And you have to understand that when it comes to God making us more like Jesus through sanctification, it's not like we can tell God, God, would you touch every area of my life but my finances? Like that's what a lot of us would prefer, right? Jesus, have anything. Just don't have this. Touch anything you want. Just don't touch this area. But this is critical for our process of becoming more and more like Jesus. Now, here's what's really cool, is that when you think of a flower going from a bud to a, a full bloom, okay, if you read about the process of how flowers develop, 
What you'll learn is this, is that by the time a flower reaches the point of a bud, it already has a fully developed root system under the soil and in the soil. So in other words, it has a fully developed root system that we can't even see. Now here's what's interesting. Paul says this in Colossians chapter two, verse six. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. That's sanctification. Continuing to live your lives in him. Verse seven, how? Rooted and built up in him. And so what we're talking about is talking about our roots going deep. Amen? In in other words, this is not the type of series that's gonna grow a church numerically, but it is the type of series that's gonna grow our people. It's gonna grow you. Our roots are gonna go deeper, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. And so what he's saying is, is that there's a process that God has us in. Every one of us is in a process of sanctification. With all of that in mind, I want you to turn with me now to 2 Corinthians 8, chapter 1, okay? 2 Corinthians 8, chapter 1. And here's how Paul writes this part of the letter. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about, okay, read the highlighted with me, the grace that God has given. Say it again. The grace that God has given the Macedonian churches, okay? And now he's talking about finances, but he's bringing the gospel back to the center. The grace that God has given them, the Macedonian churches. Now, very quickly, you need to know that geographically, Corinth was a very wealthy, influential city. The Macedonian churches are out there on the outskirts of this region. They are not wealthy, okay? They don't have the influence of Corinth or the Corinthian church. But Paul is gonna use the Macedonian churches as an example for the Corinthian church to follow after, okay? They don't have as much, but he's saying that you can follow their example. And this is what he says in verse two. Here's their example, that in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity, okay? Now, this very severe trial, a really interesting thing is happening in the Greek language that this was originally written in. It's the Greek word dokime, and it's referring to a trial, but, but not just like they went through a trial. This word means that they went through a trial and they passed the test. They went through a trial and they passed the test. So how many of us at some point in time or another, we've had this experience where we're going through the trial in life and God is lovingly leading us through the trial. And at some point in time or another, we make the decision, God, I think I'll take matters into my own hands from here. And God says, okay, have your way. And what happens? You get derailed, chaos ensues. You've got a mess on your hands. And what does God do? He lovingly, patiently brings us back to the starting line, doesn't he? Okay, let's try this again. And we go through, and at some point we decide, God, I think I'll take matters into my own hands. God says, okay. And then he lovingly and patiently brings us back to the starting line, doesn't he? Okay, why is that? Here's why. While we are all about the result, God is all about the process. We want the result, and what God is most interested in is who you are becoming in the process. Look to your neighbor, tell them you're in a process. Come on, look to your second choice, tell them you're in a process. That's what's happening, you're in this process. And God is lovingly and patiently waiting on you to trust him through the process. And there's always this temptation to take matters into our own hands, isn't it? We think we know better. At some point, we get tired of waiting on God. It could be finances. It could be relationships. It could be with work. It could be with anything. But God lovingly and patiently brings us back. And how many of us have realized and understood like God has all the time in the world, doesn't he? He's not in any hurry because he's more concerned about who you're becoming in the process. So this church is in this process and they pass the test and they're overflowing joy and their extreme poverty. And this is very powerful. It welled up in rich generosity. And so 
This word welled up. Here's the word in the Greek language. It's the word perisuo. It's the exact same word that Paul used when he said excel in verse number seven. As you excel in everything, see that you excel in this grace of giving. And here's what Paul is doing. It's hard for us to see it in the English, but if you were in the first century world hearing this or reading this in the Greek, you would have seen this very, very clearly that what Paul is doing is he's taking the example of the Macedonian church and he's telling the Corinthian church, there's your example to follow. There it is. He's saying that. That's exactly what he's saying when he uses this same word in both of these instances. Now that should tell us something because I've heard so many people say that one day when I make more, I'll get my finances in order. Or one day when I make more, I'm gonna be more generous. But how many of you have realized like it's, that's not a one day thing? What that is, is that's making a decision here and now to be obedient and to steward well what God has entrusted to you. You know, generosity and gospel-centered finances, it has nothing to do with how much you make. It has to do with the condition of your heart. This is what it comes down to. Like, listen, there's nothing wrong with having very, very nice things. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy and being well off. Nothing at all wrong with that. Nothing wrong with having nice things. What is wrong is nice things having you. And what Paul is saying is, look, this ultimately comes down to the condition, the position of your heart. This is so, so critical. And so check this out. What are the couple of types of giving? What are the couple of types of giving that we see in the word of God? Well, one type that we see in God's word is what's called the tithe. Everybody say tithe. Okay, what, is, what exactly is the tithe? Where does it come from? In Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, it says a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, it belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord, okay? So the word tithe means the first tenth, it means the first tenth. Everybody say first tenth. So Paul's, or God is not saying, you know, pay the taxes and pay the mortgage and pay the grocery bill and then give to me what's left over. No, it's the tithe, it's the first tenth. And the second observation I wanna make about this is this, is that it belongs to the Lord. So you will always hear us when we talk about the tithe, we always use language, we return our tithe to the Lord. We return our tithe. We don't give our tithe to God. Why? Because it's not ours to give. The tithe is returned to the Lord because the tithe does what? Say it with me. Belongs to the Lord. You return the tithe to the Lord. Now, I know that some of you are thinking, well, that's Mosaic law. True. But 430 years before the law, in Genesis chapter 12, Abram tithed. Now you say, well, that's all Old Testament. True. But in Matthew 23, 23, Jesus affirmed the tithe. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. And so when we talk about returning the tithe to the Lord, let me tell you from a spiritual standpoint what that is. It is the most practical expression of saying, Jesus, I invite you to be first in my finances. Jesus, I invite you to be first in my finances. And the beauty of it is this. The promise is in any area of life that when Jesus is first, order always follows. Always in, in Colossians chapter one, verse 17, he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And when Jesus is first, order always follows, which by the way, Jesus is always first. You realize that? He's always first. We're not always aligned with that reality, but Jesus is always first. And what do we know? Every one of us from experience that when we allow Jesus to be first, truly be first, 
What happens when Jesus is first in a marriage? The marriage thrives. What happens when Jesus is first in the home? The home thrives. What happens when Jesus is first in the workplace? You've got purpose in your work. What happens when Jesus is first in your finances? Order follows. When Jesus is first, order always follows. And that's why I've heard people say, like, I can't afford to tithe. No, you can't afford not to. Because when Jesus is first in your finances, order is going to follow. This is how it works. Now, let me just tell you that Carrie and I personally, we were taught to tithe from our earliest days as children. And so that when we were talking about marriage and getting married, married like this was in, no question. Like we just knew this was gonna be part of our marriage. We were always gonna trust God by returning the tithe to him. And let me just tell you that, that Carrie and I have never ever had a fight when it comes to our finances. Now we've had arguments about other things, but I can honestly say we've never ever not been on the same page when it's come to our financial world. And I really believe it just comes back to this. In fact, we believe so strongly in this that we teach our children to tithe. From the earliest ages, they get a gift, they get money, whatever, like we teach them, okay? You're gonna put the first 10% in the give, the next 10% in the save, and we do more than that, but then you've got your spend baggy as well. Give, save, spend. Now, why do we do that? Do we do that because God needs their money? No. God doesn't need their money. You say, Pastor, that's pretty desperate, teaching your kids that, like to pay the bills of the church. No. <laughs> why do we do that? because we want their root system going deep in the gospel when it comes to their financial worlds. And by the way, we do that and we teach them that because when, when they do one day want, get married, we want their husband, future husband, to be on that same page because we never ever want those girls to feel like they're having to compete for his attention and admiration with his stuff. We want his heart free as well, amen? Okay, now, one of the, my favorite things we do as a church, one of my favorite things we do, we don't talk about it all the time, but one of my favorite things we do is in order to walk with people through this process of discipleship, because we're in a process, is what we call the 90-day tithing challenge. And so I would bet that there's probably many of us here at both campuses, maybe even watching online, that maybe it's something you feel like God has been speaking to your heart on. He's been calling you to obey. And you're just like, I just, I just don't know if can I take the step. Like, I just can't take the step. It's a big step. It's a step of faith. It's trusting God with your financial world. So one of my favorite things we do to walk with couples in this process of discipleship is what's called the 90-day tithing challenge. And you can sign up at thepointva.com slash give slash challenge. And what we do is ask you to sign up and then you just tithe for the next 90 days. And at the end of those 90 days, if you do not consider yourself more blessed, all you have to do is to send an email and ask for it back. That's it. We have no list of people who've asked to this day. I don't even know the people that have signed up for it. I know that people have, but I don't know who's ever signed up for it. And I don't even know if anybody's ever asked for it back. But we just believe as a church, it is one of the most practical ways that we can walk with you through this process of discipleship. It's not a gimmick. It really is. There's no strings attached. We just wanna walk with you and we wanna be there for you. And again, if you don't feel like you're more blessed at the end of the 90 days, if you're not more full spiritually, then just ask for it back. Again, we don't keep a list of it. Again, I have no clue who's done it, who hasn't, or who's ever asked for it back. You say, well, aren't you gonna define more blessed? Like, what do you mean by more blessed? You define more blessed. Do you consider yourself more blessed, more full spiritually? And so it's a very practical thing that we as a church can do to walk with you in this process of discipleship. Then the second type of giving that we see in scripture is what's called the offering above and beyond the tithe. Now, here's what I will say about the offering. This is what we're reading about in 2 Corinthians 8, 3, okay? In this chapter in God's word, 
Paul says, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. There was no arm twisting. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And here's the key. Gospel-centered finances. Here's the key. And they exceeded our expectations. They, read the highlighted with me, gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord. Say it with me again. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord. And then by the will of God, also to us. First of all, to the Lord, they gave themselves. And because they gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, they were in alignment with God vertically. And then they just respond to needs horizontally. They didn't give themselves first to Paul. They didn't give themselves first to the need. No, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord. And this is so critical because what it tells us is the gospel was center. It was center in their lives, not just their finances, it was center in their lives. And then out of that, every other area began to come into alignment as well, including their finances. And so many of us, here's what we've told God for so long. We've said, God, you can have any area, just don't touch this area. And it doesn't work that way. When we do that, when we stiff arm God, when we hold back areas of our lives, like understand that we're missing out on God's best for us. That's what we're doing. And you don't want to miss out on God's best for your life in any area of your life. So I want to give you a, another practical step that we as a church are want to do to, to walk with you through this process of discipleship. You heard it a little earlier, but beginning in March, we're gonna be offering Financial Peace University, thepointva.com slash FPU, the beginning of March. And let me just say, let me just say that FPU is not just for those who are experiencing financial stress. It's not. It's for anyone who wants to begin to put together a gospel-centered plan when it comes to their finances, anyone. In fact, here's what I would even encourage. A segment of our congregation, of our body, that I wanna highly encourage to consider this are our college students. Now, I know a lot of you as college students, you're thinking to yourself, well, like I'm a college student, I'll set this discussion out. But let me just tell you that never is it more important than right now to begin thinking about a plan financially. Because some of you, is, you're about to launch out into a new season of your life or you're going to launch into a new season of your life and you're gonna have some college debt and you need a plan on how you're gonna resolve that. Some of you, when it comes to, hey, when it comes to this career you're about to enter into and you're gonna have this income, this steady income stream for the very first time in your life, you have gotta have a plan for how you're gonna steward that well, how you're gonna steward it responsibly, how you're gonna think about retirement, investing, and things of that nature. These are all a part of stewarding well what God has entrusted to us. And I, I, I know, I know, I know, I know. Like never are you less motivated than right now to have this discussion, but it's never more important than right now. And so nine weeks, just commit to nine weeks. If you can't be at one, we'll get you caught up. But now's a great time to take this step to begin to bring order to a financial world, whether it's now or whether it's one to come. Some of you married couples, you need to take FPU together. You need to get into this together as a couple. There are couples all over our church family, both campuses that have been a part of FPU together as a couple. And I'm telling you, they will testify that because of it, they are experiencing greater fulfillment in their marriage than ever because they're finally on the same page when it comes to their finances. It's open for anybody. And let me just tell you this, that while FPU, it does cost us as a church, I want you to know that because of the generosity of our people, that if you decide to take FPU, it's all been paid for. It's all been completely covered. So church, I wanna say thank you for your generosity. And because of your generosity, there are many people who are going to be taking steps into financial freedom. Amen? Amen? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So as we close this morning, I want to tell you that over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be diving verse by verse into 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And let me tell you that this passage is so theologically rich. It's going to be an amazing, amazing series. I pray that you'll hang in there with me. I hope pray you'll be back the next couple of weeks for this series as we get ready for the upcoming marriage series. But for this morning, what I want to do is I want to close with really the example of the Macedonian church. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And if you examine your heart this morning, the Lord's not first, then this is your opportunity today to invite him in, to be first, to be Lord. So let's stand to our feet right now, both campuses, those online, hang with us. Father, thank you for this time you've given us today in your word. Thank you for the power, the truth of your word. And God, I wanna say thank you, Lord, that your word has so much to say about our financial world. And thank you, Lord, that God, in inviting the gospel, placing the gospel in the center, God, that we come to this realization that ultimately we want to steward well all that you've entrusted to us. And so, Lord, we just want to just receive from your word, God, everything that you have for us. Speak to our hearts, Lord. And if there's any area of our hearts that we're holding back that we're not allowing you into, God, that today would be the day of surrender. Lord, I want to pray especially for those who've never said yes to you as Lord and Savior. They've never made a decision to cross the line of faith and surrender control of their lives. I want to pray that today would be the day that they would say yes to you for the very first time. And Lord, I pray right now in this moment as you're drawing them, that they would cross the line of faith. And so, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, everybody's very still and quiet for a moment. You've never said yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Today, you want to say yes for the first time. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. And I'm going to ask you, pray this prayer out loud after me. And I'm going to ask the rest of us that we would join in praying it out loud together as well, just to support those who are making this decision for the first time. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. I believe he died for me and that he rose again. Come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin, and give me the courage to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said a big amen.